from time to time. He chooses to sometimes and he doesn't choose to other times. Why don't you just say he doesn't intervene at all? Then I would understand exactly what you're saying, but you seem to me to be inconsistent and sort of jumping about in your answers. Um, sometimes you say that God doesn't intervene and, and you make a very eloquent case for why it would be a, a rather undignified sort of thing to do as a, as a God. On the other hand, you say he does intervene um, when he rescues one child from an earthquake. I think I've been over this ground. Do you want to re... I think we've covered this to some extent. Well, have you? Because Just I... wondering... Um... Uh, well, I mean, you... But, but... I haven't quite got it. I haven't quite got it myself. Okay. Re Reformulate it. it, it it's, con it, it's yes. concentrating on this one child. Is what concentrating on this one child. Yeah. Okay, yeah. right. So we're focusing on that one situation. Okay? Yeah. I think that uh, in the case of, for example, a child surviving where tens of thousands, others did not, then clearly, what, you know, other, some have died. Let me, sorry, let me start again. Just, just um, refocus. I think in the case of a situation where many thousands may have died, for example, as in a recent earthquake, yet one survives. Obviously, there is this very important question, did God choose to save that one? If so, what was wrong with all the others? And I think that the natural Christian instinct, which I believe to be correct here, is indeed to speak of God saving that child. Not because God wanted any others to perish, but because God, as it were, chose to save that one. And I think that the whole language here, which we find, for example, in Augustine, is that of God wanting to do something in the midst of a world which is not perfect. And again, the Christian vision of the world is that this is not the way God wants the world to be. It's the idea of an imperfect, a fallen world, a world of suffering, where things happen which God does not want to happen. And the key point, again, I want to stress is that I do not represent, believe it represents any failure on God's part, that this is a world of suffering, a world of death, a world where things happen which we know God would not want to happen, and at the same time be able to say that in some way God is able to bring some good out of these disasters, for example, by saving a person there, by doing something else there. Well, I think we're just going to have to leave it at that because I, I'm, I think we're never going to... Okay. Um, Resolve that. That's great. No, I'm glad we really covered that. But can we just ask three points? We live in difficult times with suicide bombers around the world, and uh, time and again, one gets the feeling that the people who perpetrate these atrocious acts are absolutely convinced that they're right. And this is not so much a, a political decision to. Uh, to do something for, well, maybe it's partly a political decision to do something for a political cause that they believe in, I'm sure it is. Uh, but, but also, the, the total conviction that you're right, to the point where you're actually prepared to kill and die for it, is something which even brave soldiers who win the Victoria Cross would, would hesitate to, to, to do. It seems to me that it's faith that gives people the ultimate courage. They're often called cowards. Of course they're not cowards. Courage is the, is, is, is the right word to, to do these things. And that alarms me very much because I'm accustomed to verbal argument. I'm accustomed to saying, right, we disagree about something. Let's sit down and talk about it. But if the other person is so absolutely convinced he's right that he won't, not only will he not talk about it, he'll actually blow himself up and me because he's so convinced. I mean, don't you see that your faith is obviously not, not in, in that category, but faith as something that is taught to children, something that they are taught to believe because they believe because they believe. Isn't that a dangerous thing to teach children? I think um, faith is a very dangerous thing. Whether one has faith there is a God, whether one has faith there is not a God. And I would want to say, I think in agreement with you and at the same point diverging from you, that faith can really inspire people to do some dreadful things. But I need to make the point very clearly that faith in God has inspired people to do bad things, as has faith in the belief that getting rid of belief in God will be a good thing for humanity. And I think there's perhaps something more true about human nature here than specifically about religion. I think that one of the things I see in human nature is that a worldview, an ideology, can inspire great acts of generosity or indeed great acts of charity and also great acts of violence. I see that in religion. I see the great acts of 
charity, I am grateful for those as the acts of violence which I deplore. But in fairness, having studied atheism during the 20th century, I've seen both things there as well. I think the real question we're confronted with as human beings is simply, if worldviews do inspire people, can we please make them do good things instead of using violence? And maybe I'm just dreaming there, but it seems to me there's something about human nature which makes us go and do bad things in the name of something that might possibly be very good. Yes, I mean, I think we largely agree there, and I, I, I think I would only add that faith itself, I would want, want people to say, I might be wrong. My, my faith is shakeable. I, I, I could be argued out of my position. Now, when you talked about uh, the dangers of faith in the desirability of getting rid of religion, I can only think you must have been thinking of Stalin there, or I mean, I, um, I can't think of anybody else who, who's, um, I mean, somebody like like Stalin. Do, do you think that it was Stalin's faith in there not being a god that drove him to do those hideous things? I'd be very surprised if it was. I think Stalin saw uh, religion as being a threat to him. Ideologically, he was uh, a Marxist Leninist, which meant that religion was seen as a cause of many evils. And certainly in the Soviet state schools of the period, religion was taught as a dogma. And I think you and I will probably agree that anything that's taught as a dogma really has the potential to do some very bad things. Yes. I think it's a little bit unfair on atheists to blame them for Stalin, um, or, and still more for Hitler, who actually wasn't an atheist. But um, even though Stalin was an atheist, what, what he was was a, was a dogmatic Marxist. Uh, and um, I, I sort of feel it's rather incidental that he happened to be an atheist, where it's very much not incidental that the suicide bombers are religious. They really believe that it's the will of God that they should do it. They really believe that if they, are, if they die as martyrs, they will have a fast track to paradise, um, which must be a terrific incentive if you believe it, as they undoubtedly do. I mean, the author Sam Harris made the rather clever point, I thought, that it's easy to understand what's going on in the world.